well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me on the program today. We're going to be talking with my friend Ryan Petty here in just a moment or two. You know, uh, one of Ryan's posts on uh, X went a little viral the other day when the vice president showed up at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida held a photo op, and then uh, proceeded to announce uh, some new gun control efforts on the part of the Biden administration, including the formation of a new office of uh, red flag laws, basically, in the Department of Justice, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on uh, states to either uh, implement red flag laws or to expand their existing laws. Uh, Ryan chiding the vice president for uh, using his daughter and the other victims of the Parkland shooting for her photo op. It was amazing to me the uh, disrespect that I mean I shouldn't be amazed or, or surprised at by any of this anymore, but the the disrespect that was shown to Ryan in the uh, comments to his post at X, basically saying uh, you know shut up and uh, you don't know what you're talking about. I think Ryan does know what he's talking about. He is someone who has dedicated, honestly, dedicated his life uh, in the years since Parkland to ensure that uh, no other parent has to go through the grief and the horror uh, that he and his wife have gone through, that their family has gone through. Ryan cares deeply about this issue. And I'm really pleased that you join me today on the program today to talk about the vice president's appearance, the Biden administration's push to expand red flag laws, uh, and what we should be doing to address the failures of government that all too often leads to these types of attacks. Take a look and a listen. Ryan, thanks so much for coming on the program. It's so good to see you again. Cam, it's always great to be here. Love uh, love chatting with you whenever we get a chance. We, we definitely need to do this more often because it seems like every time we have you on, it's because some politician has said something absolutely asinine uh, and ridiculous. In this case, it's uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president. She was down um, in Parkland last week. Uh, I, I think everybody has seen your uh, tweet uh, imploring the vice president to uh, quit uh, exploiting your daughter's death for uh, her gun control agenda. And while she was there, she announced, you know, this uh, new DOJ office, right? This this clearinghouse for uh, for red flag laws. Um, I'm I'm curious. I'll just ask you an open ended question, and then we'll get kind of delve into the details here. What is your take, and how much research have you done into what this new office is going to be doing? You know, I did a fair bit. I read through the announcement. Uh, you know, first of all, I wasn't surprised that she turned uh, a visit, which uh, ostensibly in m- many of the families that I spoke to uh, went believing that they were going to have an opportunity to um, educate the vice president on what happened at Parkland, right? The, the, the story of Parkland is really a story of government failure. It's less of, you know, has very little to do with gun control and has everything to do with multiple layers of failure uh, within the educational system and law enforcement and at all levels of government. That's really the story that I I hope the vice president would take away from from there. And I think some of the families that participated in the the event, we'll call it, uh, were hoping but I was suspicious from the beginning. I, this, this, you know, never let a tragedy go to waste, right? Is what they say, and she certainly didn't. But this was an opportunity to um, push two new gun control initiatives at the federal level. Um, I think the Biden administration has realized that they're almost out of things they can do on the executive branch side, uh, and they certainly can't get Congress to move. Uh, any further than they've already moved with the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act a couple of years ago. So here's here's what I've learned about what they're doing here. And let me relate this to what the federal government does in the education sector. So for many, you know, many of your viewers will know I sit on the State Board of Education in Florida, and I'm intimately involved in, in, in how we run our school systems here in, in the state of Florida. And we do that um, sort of a love-hate relationship with the federal government, right? The federal government supplies lots of money, but with that money comes lots of strings, lots of mandates, lots of requirements, lots of reporting and accountability. And what I see them doing here, Cam, is taking a playbook from how the federal government works with the states on education 
and using that now in this, uh, let's call it red flag or gun control realm. This isn't even about crime, let, let's be honest. It's not about improving policing at the local level. This is about encouraging states to take money now. $750 million is available to any state that would that will set up a red flag law or any state that's implemented a red flag law that wants you know to take some money from the federal government um and the goal here in my view that you know step one is to and get all of the states you know all 50 states with a red flag law that's what the federal government would like to see the second thing they'd like to do here is standardize how those red flag laws work and as you and i have talked you know I think there are 21 states with red flag laws now, 21 states and territories. Um, they all work a little bit differently. There's mm -hmm. some incredibly odious red flag laws, and there's some that are, you know, pardon the phrase, are slightly better. Uh, but the 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 main thrust is that once once a state takes that federal money, those federal strings come with it. And what we'll see are red flag laws that mimic more what California has done and maybe perhaps uh, Florida or another state has done. And so I'm very concerned about the direction this is taking. Once those federal dollars start coming into the state, it creates a dependency. And that dependency is what allows the federal government to control the behavior of the states. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. And I mean, you know, and when you look at California, you know, when when California first introduced this red flag law a few years ago, um, it reminded me of how Democrats talked about abortion back in the 90s. Right. That this should be safe, legal and rare, uh, that this was going to be a rarely used thing, only in the most extraordinary of circumstances. Right. Uh, when somebody poses an immediate threat to themselves or others, that that's when the law is going to be used. And then they start expanding the reporting requirements, right? Who who can apply for a petition, right? Uh, and they start expanding that body out beyond law enforcement, beyond immediate family members. Now it's teachers, former employers, uh, dating partners, former dating partners. You look at New York, where Governor Kathy Hochul, after the Buffalo shooting, said, you know what, uh, New York State Police, you need to start using these things whenever you can. Anytime, you, you know, there's an opportunity to file a red flag petition, whether or not you think it's actually warranted, use it. Um, and now so many guns are being seized in New York that the state police can't. I mean, they're, they're, they are they're run out of place to store all of the firearms that have been taken in. Um, I just ran across a story yesterday. This is from News Center, Maine. Washington County is behind in removing weapons from people at risk. Now, Ryan, how, how do you know? Right. What's the standard here? How many times should a red flag law be invoked, according to the gun control activists, as often as possible? That's the answer. Right. Um, and that's one of the things that concerns me is that this has gone from being something that was billed as uh, an extraordinarily rare thing that would be used to now we have to use them as often as possible. Um, and, you know, counties or states will be shamed uh, if they don't file a certain number of red flag requests if they don't take guns away from you know a certain number of people now they can't tell you what that number is but they can tell you it's not enough right uh, and i'm not sure that there is a too much i'm not sure would ever see a headline that says uh you know uh, washington county is, is is using red flag laws or yellow flag laws in maine too frequently right that that doesn't seem to be a factor for the activists look you know cam i think the end goal here is to create a new class of American citizens that are deprived of their Second Amendment rights, right? So in the in the vein of creating or making the Second Amendment a second class right, you know, now today you've got to be convicted of a felony, right? To lose your you lose your rights and you lose a package of rights when you're a convicted felon, right? And then we we talk a lot about you know restoration of rights and how that works. But at the same time, this I think where they're headed with this is to create um a, a class of American citizens that can be deprived of, of specifically their Second Amendment rights, ironically based on perhaps speech, you know, First Amendment protected speech even. And now you've got this class of citizens that uh, at a moment's notice and without proper due process 
on just the testimony of um, it could be a random citizen, could be a family member, could be a neighbor that you have a grudge with. You're now put into a class of citizens that are not allowed to keep and bear arms. And I think ultimately that's where this is headed. That's why I'm so worried about the standardization at the federal level, mm -hmm. because it won't be I mean, even if you dislike red flag laws, at least when the 50 states implement them, they're slightly differently and they can learn from each other and they can make adjustments and they can, you know, move the needle to to better due process, if you will. But once it's standardized at the federal level, now we've got a, you know, unfortunately, we don't have experimentation, number one. Number two, I think we've got a new class of citizen that it, that can easily or more easily be deprived of their Second Amendment rights. It's scary stuff. It is. And, you know, I mean, listen, there, there's obviously there's the constitutional concerns, right? There's the concerns about people being stripped of their rights without due process. Again, a one sided testimony where in ex parte hearings, you're not even present. You don't even know that a petition has been filed until after somebody comes to your door and says, hey, we're here to take your guns. Um, But for those red flag supporters, for those who say, oh, well, this is the answer. I, you know, I have questions for them because, you know, going back to something you said about Parkland, that this was a failure of government. Um, look at Lewiston. Same thing. Right. We just had this interim report come out by the commission that's been investigating the shootings in Lewiston. And they found that there were opportunities for government intervention in the weeks before the shooting took place. Um, the Maine's yellow flag law could have been utilized and it wasn't. Um, this individual could have been arrested and charged with assault for punching one of his fellow uh, National Guardsmen, and he wasn't. Um, this, uh, there's still questions about the uh, two weeks that he spent in a mental facility in New York and whether or not that was uh, an involuntary commitment or a voluntary commitment. But we know that he apparently believed he was ineligible to purchase a firearm because he attested to that when he was uh, trying to pick up a suppressor. Um, so once again, we get back to all of the things that government not just should do, but the things that government is supposed to do, right? And when government fails, inevitably it seems like the, the Democrats say, well, the answer then is to crack down on law-abiding citizens. It's not to address the failures of government. It's not to reform the system to make sure that it's working the way it should. It's to strip us of our rights to keep and bear arms back to what I you know I said at the beginning Kamala Harris came down to ostensibly learn more about Parkland and to take away the lessons of, of government failure um but she didn't announce you know any new initiatives to try to make government more accountable or to fix the problems um you know even at the federal level the FBI not passing along tips about about the shooter uh, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas that they knew about um, just a month before the, you know, before the tragedy. Um, she didn't do any of that. What she asked us to do is suspend our disbelief for a moment and believe in a world where even more government is going to somehow be better, right? Is somehow going to make us more safe or protect us in a way that uh, current government failed us. And that's the part that just left me scratching my head. It's the part that makes me the most angry. What we need from government is accountability. And, you know, this isn't uh, a novel idea, but I think the most accountable government is the government that's closest to the citizens. You know, as you well know, we blamed uh, the sheriff and the sheriff's office for some of the failures. Uh, at Parkland, and we were able to get accountability. Our governor, Governor DeSantis, removed that sheriff from office. Christopher Ray still has his job at the FBI. Uh, I don't hear any, uh, you know, anything from the vice president or the president suggesting that Christopher Ray, who was in South Florida just a week before the Parkland tragedy, promoting a DEI event, it. it at the Miami field office. What does that tell the agents at the FBI, the hardworking and many good law enforcement agents? It tells them the, the thing that's most important to the director of the FBI is not the law enforcement mission that they've been given, but it's diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
that's what he's there promoting. That's what he's focused on. Christopher Ray still has his job. And, and he's likely to not likely to be held uh, accountable for the fail, many failures of the FBI. Uh, so my point in all of this, it really, really, you know, what, what I would say to proponents of the red flag laws is, is look, government failed before Parkland. Government continues to fail us. We saw what happened in Maine. We see what happened in, in, in these other uh, attacks. What makes you believe that somehow just a little bit more government is going to make us safer? Um, I'd really love to get an answer on that. So far, I've asked a lot of folks that believe in red flag laws, and I've yet to hear a satisfactory answer. I, I have yet to hear one, too, um, and I have not had the chance to ask as many folks as you have. But, uh, you know, obviously, I read uh, columns in support of red flags, every uh, red flag laws every day. And, you know, again, they, they they this is something that they just fundamentally don't want to talk about. You know, in New York, for example, there was a uh, New York appellate court recently upheld um, red flag laws, uh, even though there was a judge that said, I think this is unconstitutional here. Um and one of the cases that was highlighted was a guy who had threatened to kill his family with an axe. And they filed a red flag petition so that he couldn't own firearms anymore. Um, he can still own an axe, Ryan. You know, he can still own the very implement that he used to threaten the lives of his family. Like that, to me, I think is a perfect encapsulation of what is wrong with these red flag laws. Let's say this guy is dangerous. Let's say this guy poses a threat to himself and his family. So you take his legally owned guns away. Does that remove the threat that this individual poses or does that just force that individual to go another route, right? Maybe he picks up that axe, maybe he picks up a knife from the kitchen. Maybe he goes and he buys a gun on the black market. Um, but, you know, most of these red flag laws, as you all know, they have no mental health component to them whatsoever, not in terms of, uh, you know, diagnosing or, or, or you know, um, uh, discovering if somebody truly is dangerous. No help on the back end if somebody is deemed to be a threat to themselves or others. They're on their own. Once the gun is removed, uh, the system considers the problem solved. And that's just not the case. When we're dealing with somebody, in the case of the Parkland killer, somebody with such evil intentions, why would we think that depriving them of the ability to legally possess a firearm is going to stop that problem, is going gonna, is gonna to end that threat? I just don't get it. You know, I got a I got a message from uh, somebody in the Secret Service. I'll, they need to remain anonymous, obviously, but they they thanked me for standing up uh, this week and challenging what Kamala Harris was doing uh, and the new announcements. One of the things I learned from the Secret Service is that when when they address a threat, they to your point, they go to understand what's going on in that person's life. Why does this person, let's, for example, let's say you or I threaten the president. We're going to get a visit from the Secret Service. And they're not there necessarily to deprive us of our rights, to arrest us, to put us in jail. They're there first and foremost to understand what was the cause of the threat? Why did we make the threat? What's going on in our lives? And what they find many times is it really hasn't less to do with the president, and it's not actually a, a threat that the person could carry out, it's just somebody that's got something going on in their lives, a triggering event that that needs to be addressed. And what they do, Cam, to your point, is they bring in resources to help that person. Let's say somebody's having financial difficulties. They just lost their job. Secret Service is going to bring in some resources and try to help that person get through that. And what they found in doing that is that they solved the problem. The goal or the issue isn't removing the person's firearms. That doesn't solve the problem. That just takes one possible attack vector out of the mix. And really what you need to do is address the problem. So you, you've talked about this at length, and I think you're absolutely right. And what I don't see from the gun control community and the Biden administration is a meaningful attempt at making let's neither of us like red flag laws but they want uh more of them i'd say if we're gonna have to live with them let's make them better 
first of all, let's address the due process issues, right? Let's let's have a real conversation about what we could do to get due process back into the right sequence of events, the sequence of events that were imagined by our founding fathers and are uh, articulated and documented in our constitution. Let's get there, right, as a, as a goal. And then second, Let's not make it just about guns. To your point, let's let's address any potential threat. And how do you do that? Well, you have to solve the you have to solve the issue going on in the person's life. That's that's the next step we need to take. Um, but, uh, yeah. If you can do those Listen, things, that might that might be better, right? And I don't and I don't disagree with you. But now you're not talking about red flag laws. I mean, that's the thing. Now you're talking about something entirely different, right? Because red flag laws are about the gun. They're designed to be about the gun. They're not designed to be about mental health. They're, you know, when when Virginia was uh, debating their red flag law, I, I specifically remember, I can't remember what lawmaker it was, but there was a Democrat who was vociferous and she admitted it. She said, this is not about mental health. And she's right. It's not about mental health. And that's, I think, where you and I and a lot of folks would like to take this conversation because we do have a mental health crisis in this country, both in terms of the number of people who are feeling this hopelessness and despair. Who, who do need an outlet and do need help, but we also have a shortage of resources. Almost every state in the country has a critical shortage of inpatient beds for those who are in acute crisis. Uh, they have a shortage of counselors and therapists for folks who you know, could use somebody to talk to once a week or twice a week. Um, and there are things that can be done, right? I think that we could be doing a lot with telemedicine. Uh, as somebody who lives in a rural area, you know, virtual therapy has been a, a godsend after the loss of uh, my own child a couple of years ago. My family members went through virtual therapy and because we didn't have counselors available in person. Um, you know, there that that and that's the other part of this that drives me crazy, Ryan, is that because you don't agree with Kamala Harris, because you don't agree with Joe Biden, you don't agree with Steve Dettelbach and the gun control groups. All of a sudden now you're part of the problem. Right. They don't want to listen to your perspective. They don't want to listen to what you have to say because you don't agree with with their solutions. You must be part of the problem and I must be part of the problem and gun owners must be part of the problem when, in fact, I, you know, I know gun owners who are working on the front lines. We were just talking the other day with a gun store owner in Wisconsin who, you know, takes in guns when somebody says, hey, listen, I, I, I need to temporarily have a place to store these. Um, this is a great alternative to red flag laws. That is a solution, right? But not according to the gun control activists because we're not embracing their their agenda. Yeah, like I said, the goal the goal here is you know the the guns are the problem. The gun owners are a problem, uh, whether you committed a crime or not. And that's their worldview. So that's yeah. sort of how they base at all of their legislative initiatives. That's how they they base it on those two core principles, and. They're not really interested in in attacking the problem in any meaningful way. I mean, if, if Kamala Harris was actually interested in solving gun violence, we would hear a lot more about how do we prevent suicide, right? Because the largest chunk of quote unquote gun violence are unfortunately suicides. And I don't hear them talking about, I mean, yeah, they make they they talk a little bit or they talk around the issue, but in any meaningful way, you know, I would see them working with the gun industry, as an example, to to uh, educate uh, gun store uh, owners and FFLs like myself on spotting the warning signs and being able to, uh, you know, keep keep a firearm out of the hands of somebody that's buying it just to hurt themselves. But they don't work on any of those things. I don't see any movement there. It's really about demonizing. And to my point earlier, I think re creating a new class of American citizens that are deprived of their Second Amendment rights. I think that's where they're headed uh, because they do view us as the problem. Yeah, I think you're right. Now, I know that uh, you said on Twitter that uh, or X that um, you were invited to attend this uh, gathering. You chose not to. Um, was that a difficult decision for you? Was there a part of you that uh, was hoping to get some face time with the vice president so you could talk about this stuff face to face? Yeah. Absolutely. I, you know, from the beginning, I've been willing to talk with almost anyone and work with almost anyone. Um, I, I engaged with the Biden administration early on in their in their first term. In fact, I, I did a Zoom call with his first chief of staff and that team and what became uh, some of the members that became the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. They made it 
abundantly clear to me uh, early on and to I was surrounded by some other Parkland families that nothing short of new gun control would be satisfactory to them and that they weren't really interested in the other things that Florida had done to protect uh, our schools. So at that point, you know, uh, look, the ideologues are running uh, the Biden administration. They're, in, you know, they, like I said, they view guns and gun owners as the problem. And so they're really only interested in new gun control solutions and not so much interested in anything that we would have to say. And so based on that analysis, I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give Kamala Harris an opportunity to use my face and the image of my daughter to promote more gun control. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. In fact, I'm going to call her out for doing that. Well, I'm glad that you did. And I'm glad that you uh, were able to spend some time with us today, Ryan. I always appreciate getting to spend a few minutes with you. Thank you for everything you're doing there in uh, Florida. And um, hope we get a chance to talk again very, very soon. Great to be here, Cam. Good to see you. I appreciate Ryan being with us on the program. Appreciate his advocacy even more, quite honestly. But uh, thank you again for uh, coming on the show. Um, all right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a story out of Illinois, where the state's top parole official has quit after a uh, man was released on parole, and then I think it was the very next day, goes and attacks his ex, ultimately killing an 11-year-old child. Uh, Donald Shelton served on the Illinois Prisoner Review Board for more than a decade, he uh, headed up that panel uh, starting in 2023, and the uh, Illinois governor, J.B. Prisker, announced his resignation on Monday, uh, hour, uh, hours after the governor also disclosed that uh, another board member, Leanne Miller, quit her uh, position on the board for her role in allowing this uh, guy, Crescetti Brand, uh, to be released from custody following a hearing to determine whether or not he had violated his parole. Again, just a day after his release, Brand allegedly stabbed an 11-year-old, Jaden Perkins, when the boy tried to intervene as Brand was allegedly attacking the boy's pregnant mother at her home in Chicago. She was stabbed during the attack as well, but she survived her injuries only to lose her child. Now, Prisker lavished praise on Shelton uh, for, quote, providing a model of dedication to public service and working, quote, diligently to keep Illinoisans safe and uphold our justice system. Right. Uh, he also said a couple of hours before he said that, that, uh, quote, uh, the Prisoner Review Board must be able to operate independently as they review enormously difficult cases. Uh, but I believe that Leanne Miller has made the correct decision in stepping down from her role. It is clear that evidence in this case was not given the careful consideration that victims of domestic violence deserve. And I am committed to ensuring that additional safeguards and training are in place to prevent tragedies like this from happening again. No, you're not. You're trying to cover your ass. That's what you're doing. We have so many cases in Illinois right now, thanks to the Safety Act, of individuals who have been accused, convicted of their crimes, released on parole. They are arrested again. They are charged with other crimes. They are released without having to post any bail or bond. You've got an effort underway to minimize the amount of time that uh, certain violent offenders are serving. At the same time, by the way, the state of Illinois continues to crack down on lawful gun owners, right? I mean, this is absolutely asinine for the governor to engage in this type of double speak when it's in large part the policies that the Democrat majority in Illinois have put in place that have allowed situations like this to happen. Tony McComey, who is the uh, House Republican leader in uh, Springfield, called for an overhaul of the review board, saying that lives were lost because of the lack of responsibility and due diligence at the uh, uh, parole board. When innocent people die because of bad policy, we must correct course immediately. I, I would agree. But again, fortunately for the governor, I think he is more interested in covering his uh, ample rear end rather than actually addressing the problem. Kind of like what we were talking about with Ryan and the Biden administration when it comes to gun control. Today's armed citizen story from Fort Worth, Texas, where police say a burglary suspect was shot by their intended victim. Well, I don't know if they actually intended 
to harm this individual, but they made the bad mistake of breaking into a vehicle that was occupied at the time. This was uh, early Sunday morning, just after 3 a.m. or just before 3 a.m. in Fort Worth. Uh, officers got a call about shots fired. When they arrived on scene, they found that someone had been shot, taken to a hospital in a critical condition. Investigators say the person who had been shot had just burglarized a vehicle that, again, was occupied. There were people inside, and that one of the occupants of that vehicle ended up shooting the uh, suspect as they were trying to break in. Police say the burglary victims remained on scene. They are cooperating. Don't have a lot of details other than, again, a last report, the uh, burglary suspect was in critical condition and the uh, occupants of that vehicle not expected to face any charges because they were acting in self-defense. Finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, a uh, firefighter on an airplane heading to Arizona who uh, really was in the right place at the right time. Matthew Hader was uh, hoping to just get a little R&R, taking a little vacation to Arizona from uh, Wisconsin. Says it was a very last minute to head west. But uh, as he was on board the Southwest flight from Milwaukee to Phoenix, I believe, back on uh, March 17th, the assistant chief of the Lake County Fire and Rescue uh, ended up being involved in a medical emergency. There was a passenger on board who lost consciousness about halfway through the flight the uh, crew wasn't sure if the man was still breathing. Uh, Hater's still at the back of the airplane at that point. He said, uh, you know, it probably would have been something that probably could have gone a different direction if the individual hadn't been treated in the way that they were, which is, a, I guess, a roundabout way of saying this could have been far more serious if there was not somebody like Hater on board to help provide immediate medical assistance. Uh, Hater said that he gave the man an IV, uh, helped uh, the man regain his breath. It sounds like CPR was uh, done at that point. So the pilot questioned if an emergency landing was necessary. And Hader said, well, you're not going to be on the ground in five minutes. You know, you can't call for another ambulance or fire engine to help. Eventually, the uh, flight uh, remained on course, landed in Phoenix. Uh, They were in the air for about two more hours before they reached the uh, destination. Emergency crews were waiting when the doors opened. Um, But it sounds like this gentleman is going to be okay. Uh, in large part because Matthew Hader was there on board that aircraft. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, Fox 6 in Milwaukee reports that when Hader landed and was able to look at his phone for the first time in a couple of hours, he said that he had gotten an email congratulating him on 30 years of service as a paramedic. I mean, how's that for a uh, opportune email? He said, you know, anyone else in the same position would have done the same thing. I'd like to believe that that's the case. I, I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is the case. But it was Matthew Hader who was in that position. It was Matthew Hader who stepped up and did the right thing and saved a life on board that flight. And so, Matthew Hader, we thank you for your very, very good deed. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you, as always, for being a part of the program. And I'm looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. But don't forget to check out BearingArms.com throughout the day. We're keeping you up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. And if you like what you see, I would encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Just go to BearingArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP or VIP Gold membership. And we're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. News stories, analysis, opinion, because your support really does matter. And it truly does make a difference. As big tech is waging war on independent media, on conservative media, support from folks like you helps us continue to do the job that we do each and every day. So again, barryandarms.com slash subscribe and use that promo code Save America. We'll see you back here tomorrow with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. You can check me out on Newsmax in the 5 p.m. Eastern hour tonight with Carl Higby. Looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.